In part four of our investigation of Aristotle's metaphysics, we're looking at the unmoved mover. And I'm going to use some text from his book, The Physics, to describe an argument for the existence of the unmoved mover. And then I'm going to use some text from the metaphysics to describe some of the characteristics of the unmoved mover. So for Aristotle, he argues that if motion ever ceased, it could not begin again because then nothing would be in motion to cause motion. The motion that we are familiar with requires something to be moving. Even the existence of biological entities requires the movement of their predecessors. Seeds for plants, parents for most animals, and so on. So motion must be everlasting for Aristotle. And then we can divide the kinds of things that cause motion into two groups. For some causes of motion, it's possible for them to exist and not exist, to be and to not be. And this means that some self-movers are contingent. Animals and plants, humans, are self-movers. We have within the form of ourselves, within our nature, a source of motion. And it's possible for us, animals, plants, to exist or obviously to fail to exist. Now, if every cause of motion was contingent like this, then there would be no explanation of what causes the movers as a whole to exist. Now, in the metaphysics, Aristotle uses a premise that goes, fits into this part of the argument by saying, eventually there would be a time when nothing was in motion. And you have some hints here of the differences that the medievals made in their arguments for the existence of God, some of them relying on time in the Kalam argument in the Arabic tra tradition, and some that don't require an appeal to time, like Aquinas' arguments. So there must be one or more everlasting unmoved movers. If we can't say that everything is a contingent mover, that doesn't make sense. You have to have an everlasting mover, and that everlasting mover can't be caused to move by something else, otherwise you would have an infinite regress. And so we have to have at least one unmoved mover and one is going to be sufficient to explain motion. We don't have to have several. And so by parsimony, we conclude that there must be one unmoved mover that is everlasting. And so Aristotle reasons that there has to be an everlasting unmoved mover that exists. Now, what can we say about the nature of the unmoved mover. That which is always moved, if it's actually moving, and it's constantly moving, it must move in a circular motion, like the heavens do, according to Aristotle. So maybe the heavens is our candidate. But the heavens cannot move themselves. Again, this would be an infinite regress. They're already in motion, so we have no explanation of what's causing the mo motion of the heavens at all. So Aristotle concludes that there must be a mover which moves. It produces motion without being moved, that is, without moving itself. So it's, and it's not caused to move by anything outside of itself. So it's unmoved, it has no motion itself physically, but it has to have motion in some sense. 
it has to be eternal. It has to be a substance, something that actually exists. And it can't just be in potentiality. It has to be in actuality. So we have this mover that moves, that is causes motion without itself being caused to move. And it has to be eternal and it has to be in actuality. And so the unmoved mover for Aristotle, how do you explain this? What kind of thing could this be? It's an object of desire and or an object of thought. And for Aristotle, it's actually both of these things. So what would cause the heavens to move eternally? A desire of sorts, a purpose of sorts, and in a, a goal of being like the unmoved mover. And so the unmoved mover being something that is in motion, not caused to be in motion, is an object of desire. The heavens want to be like it to speak metaphorically. So the unmoved mover is that for the sake of which everything else moves. And that for the sake of which is how we define the good. So we saw that in Aristotle's ethics. And therefore the unmoved mover is the good. And since the unmoved mover is the good, it makes sense to identify it as God, right? The unmoved mover exists necessarily, right? Couldn't possibly be contingent, something that might fail to exist, right? And it has to be there for without it, no other motion is going to occur. And what kind of motion are we talking about? Again, it can't be a physical motion, a circular motion like the heavens, so the unmoved mover is, the, the motion of the unmoved mover is thinking. Now, what is it thinking about? Well, whatever it thinks about has to be something perfect. And so it's thinking about thinking. It's a thinking on thinking. Now, the act of contemplation for Aristotle is the most divine act possible. We saw that at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, where the ultimate happiness for a human is studying, thinking, contemplating. And so the unmoved mover, if that's a, the most divine action possible, the unmoved mover or the good is God. Now, if God is thinking, then God is a living being. Active thinking is life, and it has to be eternal, and it has, God has to be in an active state. Now, this phrase, thinking on thinking, God would not be lowering himself to think about anything else, for anything else would be imperfect compared to God, and so that's why God is a thinking on thinking. So, we wrap up this idea with this quotation here from the metaphysics. We say, therefore, that God is a living being, eternal, most good, so that life and duration continuous and eternal belong, belongs to God, for this is God. Now, some might ask, does Aristotle really use the word God here? And absolutely he does. He uses the singular Greek word for God, and I'm capitalizing it here because we're talking about one, the one thing, and obviously those who came after Aristotle are using his arguments to draw the conclusion that God of the Western religions exist. So we should make a distinction here. Certainly the God that Aristotle concludes exists is different from the ones, the God of Aristotle or Avicenna, for example. One of the big differences is that this God has no concern, Aristotle's God has no concern for individual lives and what's going on in personal lives. There's no love in the sense that the Western traditions ascribe to God. 
there's no moral justice that would be beneath this kind of God. So there are significant differences between the God that Aristotle concludes exists and the God of the Western traditions. But even though they are significantly different here, we can see easily how those who believe that God exists would see an argument for the existence of God in Aristotle, and we can certainly see how that gets explored and developed much more thoroughly in the Arabic traditions of medieval philosophy and in the Christian traditions of medieval philosophy. And those traditions actually have continuing proponents today. And so you will see cosmological arguments that are contemporary versions of cosmological arguments that ultimately owe their origin to Aristotle. 